Hi, I'm Ann Mutchler, Executive Editor for EDA at Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here in Santa Rosa, California at Keysight Headquarters with Darren McLearnan, Product Manager for RF and Microwave Simulation. Today we're going to talk about the densification of RF designs and the challenges associated with heterogeneous integration. Darren, thank you for your time. Can you talk about the trends around densification today in RF design and what are we seeing with heterogeneous integration? You know, a lot of our trends in our industry are driven off of the cell phone you know, industry. Trying to pack more capability, more customer experience into a smaller space that lasts longer on battery and is, is green and just has these immersive experiences. A lot of that is, they drive whole sections of our industry. The space, weight and power aspect, and the power density and heat of putting more capability in a smaller space. The new frequencies that take advantage of spectrums and things like beamforming and MIMO that underwrite some of these customer experiences have to fit in these smaller spaces. So new frequencies and then higher power levels to try to get signals and coverage to different places. You know, trying to pack that into an existing form factor is just driving a whole bunch of densification problems. And the short way of saying it is if you put that much capability in a smaller place, in a smaller volume, and if you had EMI or EM problems before, if you had thermal, you're compacting all of the problems into a smaller space. And so it gets harder and harder to isolate just one problem from the others and attack them in one dimension at a time. You really are getting into a co-design space where the RF is the deal breaker because in the old days you could do just simple parasitic extractions and use the extension cords onto the digital design tools to do a little bit of high quality analog. When you get to microwave and some of the higher electromagnetics, there are effects that come into play that just aren't natural extensions of the old paradigm. They're, they're deal breakers and you need new technology. Can you go into a little bit more detail about the EDA solutions that enable co-design and simulation and what that means for the engineer? Yeah, sure. Um, and back to our cell phone analogy, you know, this, this gets into both heterogeneous integration and multiple simulation domains, or what we call, you know, multi-technology. Um, in heterogeneous integration, it takes a village. You can't put that much power on a silicon power amp. You'll need gallium nitride or gallium arsenide, a 3.5 compound semi. And you get into a, a sort of a chiplet configuration where you're integrating multiple chipsets into one module. You'll also find that to solve multiple problems in a small space, you start needing to co-design more aggressively. The problem is that thermal, electromagnetics, circuit simulation, and even things like, it's undercounted, but secondary effects like modulation of a wide bandwidth creates interference and spurs. The conditioning of some of the signal traces creates stability problems. When you put that much, what is ground? What is power? These existential electrical questions for an amplifier can turn it into an oscillator. So you, you really need to co-design. The problem is that thermal or EM, 3D EM, multiplanar EM, they tend to be very expert driven. So if you have an external tool that is the best of its kind, what you do as a chip designer is I export something to that tool and I must memorize the culture, all the little settings, master all the port little setups and, and idiosyncrasies of that tool, do my thing and then get back to my main environment and now I'm going to do this tool. Now I'm going to do this tool. And by the time you've trick-or-treated around the technology space, you've translated your design, re-imported it, translated it, re-imported it. It's a lot of manual effort. It's a lot of domain expertise. And I think one thing that makes 
some of this more possible is having a use model that's circuit designer centric, whose neck is really on, on the stump for, for making a chip work, putting things in his culture and bringing the tools to them. And, and so that drives a number of, of tool choices. So Darren, what I'm hearing you say really is about an open ecosystem approach. An open ecosystem approach is absolutely essential. For one thing, let's not pretend that one vendor is going to solve all your problems. Even if that were true now, is that going to be true in a certain amount of time? The pace of innovation is so fast, it does take a village. We find that it's necessary to allow scripting and for customers, our, our end users, to actually add value and external innovation of their own that's a proprietary value generation advantage for that company to wrap around our tools. So for, for interoperability, our database is based on open access. You can save something in one platform, open it in another, make a change, save it, and open it again, and really not have to transfer things. That paradigm is, is essential, but the, also the idea that within our platforms, we're opening up the guts of our APIs so that they're externally scriptable. So if you want to have AI ML of your own choice or to do regression harnesses or automation using a Python and standards-based tool sets, we've opened the guts of our platforms to allow you to do that. And that not only allows control and for a company to do their own proprietary value generation advantage that is a persistent advantage, it allows them to innovate faster than any individual vendor. We like our technology, we're real proud of it, but but the industry is moving so fast that you need the freedom to innovate faster than any one player. And it also allows scale. I mean, there's the ability to not only do one, but many, and to do it at a larger organizational and volume and, and, and manufacturing mix. And so scale is an important part of reducing the cost basis. And so these trends are gonna be nowhere more apparent than as we move towards 6G. Because as we get into these sub-terahertz kinds of frequency bands, everything that was problematic about FR2, about the 28 gigahertz and beam forming, that's an existential crisis in these bands. As you get higher into millimeter wave and into above 100 gigahertz into the sub-terahertz bands, there's a whole bunch of things that just stop working. You, you can't ignore certain kinds of parasitics. L's and C's are not an appropriate response to the kinds of structures that you're going to be finding in millimeter wave. And so, again, we have really good technology in, in that. We have a bit of a lead as a company. I think the ability to future-proof your flow and to, to go with a lead, but to actually anticipate where the market is headed on this openness, these use models that allow a designer to resolve multiple dimensions in one go and really control it is, is going to be essential for going quickly and getting to market quickly. One last question about addressing multiple technologies. And really, when you were discussing that, it speaks to reliability of the end products. Can you explain how making sure we simulate everything addresses reliability concerns. Yeah, reliability has a number of dimensions. Let me just hit on a, on a couple. One is service lifetime. Thermal ends up being a really key consideration. Every 10 degrees you raise the temperature, cuts the MTBF by some huge factor. I think it's in half. Not just the coarse floor planning thermal, but the instantaneous, you know, inside these structures, um, the device, you know, electromigration and stuff is key. And so there's that dimension. There's also the reliability of just the margins. As you get higher in frequency, especially in millimeter wave stuff, begins to have a dimensional accuracy and variability. The mechanical tolerances are now becoming part of a wavelength. 
they're becoming more significant. So you need to look at manufacturing spreads and are we on the margins? There's also signals. We spend a great deal of time making great equipment and chips, but the signals passing through them are also much more sophisticated. If you look at the dynamic range of a noise floor coming up and the amount of power you have to work with coming down as you go up in frequency, your dynamic range is actually narrower and narrower, but the trouble is that the peak to average ratio of some of the signals is actually you know, related to this. So there's a sweet spot. You have this narrowing sweet spot of the kinds of signals you can run through. And so for really wide bandwidth, 100, 200, 400 megahertz kinds of signals, you get into really stressful signals that have high peaks. A 10 dB peak factor, you're, you're dealing with factors of 10 in power over the average power. What that does is it stresses the design and the reliability, the performance, everything about the customer experience actually is degraded by the signal. You don't control the signal. You're designing in a chip. You don't control the waveforms going through that chip, but you can anticipate it. And that's part of how treating waveforms as one of the technologies in a multi-technology is important to look at stability and the reliability of, of these, uh, these systems. Darren, thank you so much for your time today. It's been great. Thanks so much.